All right. Um, can you all hear me okay? We're going to be starting off in Romans chapter 15 this morning. And again, we're... Uh, we are still talking about the doctrine of consecration. There's a, that's, a, that's a pretty broad uh, topic from the scriptures for us. And uh, consecrating our lives to the Lord and to the things of God. And uh, I, I run you through the first test again. When you truly, truly trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you got justified. Amen. Just as though you've never sinned. Isn't that grace? Amen. Man, that's really grace. Um, and then the Lord picked you up and He did what? He set you aside. He set you apart. And you're sanctified. You become a child of God. A born again believer in Christ. You get set apart, you're sanctified, and uh, then we look forward to that glorious hope that we have, and that's the Lord appearing in the clouds of glory, amen? amen. And um, um, which is our glorification, and now we're looking at consecration, consecration. and that's... Uh, Growing in the Lord, dedicating our lives to serving Him uh, during our time on the face of this earth. And you always want to know uh, that the Lord is, is, He asks a question, how will we be found when He comes? How will we be found? It would be great to be found right here, right now. Amen. <laughs> that would be the great thing. Um, but when church lets out today and you all go home for the afternoon, and, you, and those of you that come back tonight and, 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 and receive a blessing, then Monday morning you start, you start all over again if, if the Lord allows you to wake up. And uh, how, you know, how are you going to be found Monday? Well, we want to be found the same every day. We want to be found dedicating our lives to the Lord. So we've, we've talked about the weaker brother, we've been talking about that in this area of consecration and talking about Apostle Paul knew, God gave him the words, he knew that, that this, this, this newfound, if you will, uh, uh, age of grace uh, that, that Christ bought for us on the cross of Calvary, that the Lord gave us as a gift, this newfound age of grace uh, is going to mean that, wow, I'm going to have church services, and I'm going to have, in this New Testament time, I'm going to have church services, and there's going to be people who are, are um, they are relatively seasoned believers, and seasoned in their faith, but then I'm going to have new people in their faith, and we all know, and I've shared with you millions of times probably, how my prayer has been since I've been here, that the Lord gives us the ability to be able to knit our hearts together in His love for one another. Because not all of us have the same level of faith, do we? We all have the same grace extended to us. So, so we've talked about how is it uh, throughout the scriptures that I can do something uh, that would make maybe a, a weaker brother or sister in the Lord to stumble. Uh, we have to be careful about that. Uh, and I've talked about that a lot. But, you know, one of the things that we have is by doing nothing as well, we can look pretty bad. And, and you've heard me, <laughs> no pun intended, you've heard me harping on that uh, uh, for the last couple of months that Christianity, true Christianity, needs to get off their duff and take a stand in this nation. We have a problem. We have a real problem. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, it's because we've done nothing. nothing. Um, we, that's why we have so many problems, because God's people have done nothing. They, they went to sleep at the wheel, so to speak, uh, in the overall picture. We have to be willing to stand up and testify for God in our lives every day. 
uh, through our actions, through our words, through our hearts and minds. We have to be, able to be willing to do that. We have to be willing to stand for what's right. And I'm not saying man's definition of right. I'm saying God's definition of right. Um, and, 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 you know, and I get on the soapbox, and, 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 and it's okay to get on the soapbox, especially if we're doing it for God. But you know what? As an independent, fundamental Baptist preacher, I'm sick of Christianity in this country. I am fed up with it. Way above my ears, fed up with it. My daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren live not very far at all from the tragedy that took place in Oregon, in Roseburg. And ten people that were killed there, nine wounded. And the fact is, this wasn't some rogue person from the outside. This was an insider. This was somebody who went to school with those people. This is somebody just as though it could be somebody sitting in here. This was a total act of godlessness. It was an act of godlessness. And, you know, Christians, when, if a person is truly saved, then they have the Holy Spirit of God in them. Amen? Amen. You have it. You don't have to wait for it to show up. You don't have to wait for him to show up. He's with you. Lord Jesus Christ said, I will send the Comforter to you. And he does just that. These things, these acts are sheer god godlessness. This isn't about guns and it's not about mental health. This is godlessness. And unfortunately, the leaders in this nation don't care about God. No. They don't care about that. They care about their agendas. And you say, well, what's all this got to do with consecration? I'll tell you, because it's a great example of what not to be. It's a great example of what not to be. Listen, if I utter the name of Christian, if I say I'm a Christian, that means Christ-like. That's what that means. That means, that means I believe that the Son of God died for me personally. If he would have died for nobody else, he died for me on that cross. I believe that. I believe he rose again. And I believe he was seen by many on the face of this earth. And I believe he ascended. And I believe he's going to come back again. And I believe everything from cover to cover in the word that he left us. And I believe that he was the word made flesh. And I believe he existed before the virgin birth. Because he said back in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And God said let us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Create man in our image. Even before man was created. I believe in John 1, 1, when, when in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I believe in John 1, 14, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us in the form of our Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> People that make the decisions and say the things that they say, at the same time they identify themselves with that label as being Christian in our government leadership, are wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing. My Savior said, what? Beware. And I'm telling y'all, Christianity, true Christians, we need to beware. We need to beware. We need to challenge those things. I'm not saying picking up stones and rioting and doing a bunch of, a bunch of crazy stuff. I'm saying be heard at the voting bout. Be heard in your personal lives. Be heard amongst the voices and the ears around you. Be heard, be heard, be heard. And what a tragedy this was in Roseburg, Oregon. What a tragedy. And it's a hot button topic and I'm going to hit it. And I don't care if this goes out across the nation. I hope it does. And I hope it wakes somebody up. It's a tragedy. I prayed for those families of those lost people, those people that were they lost their lives, the injured people. This fellow students that had to witness such a thing, how can they go back? I mean, those poor people. It's devastating. And I listen to the talking heads on TV about its mental health issues, its copycat stuff, it's this. Listen, those are all symptoms. Those are treating symptoms. You can go and you want to get drugs to treat symptoms. You'll treat symptoms all day long, but until you cure the disease, you're not going to stop the symptoms. 
And, this, and the disease is godlessness. It's godlessness. This isn't an act of mental health. It's not an act about firearms issues. It's evil. That's what it is. You know, this act of godlessness was immediately, dis the, it was dismissed as an act of godlessness, immediately. Didn't even enter the arena by our political leadership in this country. It, it ended up being political rhetoric and it captivated and it was used for a political opportunity to, to establish more gun laws. Yep. That's what I heard. That's all I heard. There was no time, there was no format, there was nothing directed towards the anti-Christian message of the shooter by the leaders of our nation. It's, it's that, well, we got to do something about guns being sold. Well, let me tell you something. You find me a store in Ravana, Ohio, or Portage County, Ohio, or Trumbull County, Ohio, or Mahoney County, or Summit County, that you can walk in and buy heroin across the counter. But it's destroying our society. And it's not sold in a store. It's called godlessness. But instead of all of this, political rhetoric was applied to treat the symptoms of that disease of godliness. And a tale of untruthfulness by our nation's leaders is, is cast forth and spun from this tragedy to capitalize on political agendas. Get guns out of the hands of people. Disregard the Second Amendment of our Constitution and further reduce the ability to protect the Christian nation. That's what I heard. A statement such as, you know, states with the strongest gun laws have the least gun violence. Listen, I just retired out of 38 years of law enforcement and I've never heard more bunk than that. And I can speak with experience on that note. Right. You know the hometown of the President of the United States of America <laughs> has more restrictive gun laws than most any place in the nation? I said it has the most restrictive gun laws of any place in the nation. And it's off the charts with gun-related crime. Exactly. And just as the leadership of this nation is trying to take away our constitutional rights, the Second Amendment, and our First Amendment rights, and put people in jail because of their religious convictions for the Lord, taking rights away from Christians, not lending any credence to a man goes in and says, are you a Christian? Yeah. Boom! Every report from Oregon that heard that man that can still talk gives the same story. Yep. That's what he did. That's what he did. But it's okay to protect ISIS. Right. It's okay to protect the Muslims and their rights while you take away the Christian rights right. and you suppress them. Mm -hmm. It's okay when I see in this morning's newspaper that a political candidate for the presidency of the United States of America, one nation under God, ha ha. It's okay to say, you know, the pillar of my presidency is going to be for the lesbian, gay, transsexual, bisexual agenda. The pillar. Read it on the front page of your local newspaper. It's there. It's not going to be to protect a God-fearing nation. No. We're in trouble. And before you think, well, Pastor, you're, you're, you're talking politics. No, I'm talking God. I'm talking God. You know, several days ago, the United Nations, the United Nations, the president of Australia, you know, the land down under, it looks like you inverted us and turned us upside down when you look at the map. 
He directed a statement towards our government. And he referenced this nation's leader. And he directed a statement that he called it a traitorous act relative to the Iranian nuclear, de nuclear deal. Yep. He, and you know what? It is just totally astounding to me, some little peon Baptist preacher in Ravenna, Ohio, it's astounding to me that a foreign leader in the land down under can see so many things that Americans can't see. Yep. We hide from standing with our allies. We hide for, from standing for God's people and God's purposes. We hide for standing with Israel in our nation. How many of um, I, I will get to the lesson. This is part of the lesson, by the way, because I'm trying to teach us what not to be. Yeah. We need to change and consecrating our lives for the Lord. You know, how many of you, you how many of you have watched the old Billy Jack movies? <laughs> you know what those are? The old Billy Jack movies? Not too many of you, so I'm dating myself. You know, there was a guy there was a guy that walked into the park on one of those movies. He says, I'm going to take this foot I'm going to kick you in this side of your face. Just like that. And he says, and there's nothing you're going to do about it. The great bear, the Norse leader walked up to our leader with a 24 hour notice and did the same thing. In 24 hours, we are going to invade Syria. And you're not going to do anything about it. And he's absolutely right. Absolutely right. What did our leadership say? We're going to have to talk about this. prophecy of Ezekiel we're watching in our blessed time take place. Now we're not going to be here for it, okay? Thank God. You getting the hint? <laughs> How long will it be? <clears throat> There's ships from Russia setting in the sea right now. And it's, isn't, it, isn't it something that the first bombings that Russia did, the very first bombings in the nation of Syria after giving the United States of America 24-hour notice that we're going to go to Syria, was against the rebels that were trying to fight ISIS. That's who they bombed. That happens to be the very same people that our nation has been helping supply things to fight ISIS. What's that tell you? Wolves? Yeah. Look at uh, Acts chapter 17 with me. And we'll come back to Romans 15 and spend a couple minutes in it anyhow. You know, right now, our nation stands for godlessness. Yep. That's what it stands for. It's not one nation under God. It stands for godlessness. How, how so? Doesn't matter how the people vote. You put guys in power within your Supreme Court that will vote for same-sex marriage, and voila, it's done. You legislate from the bench, and you, you, make, you write the laws, and you don't allow the people to have a voice. You make a stand against Christianity. And you use the laws of the nation to do that. You come up with silly things that don't even exist in the United States Constitution, such as separation of church and state. Such language does not exist. You heard that message a week or so ago. You, you stand against the right of self-protection of the citizens of this nation. 
Look at Acts chapter 17. I want you, I want you to particularly look at uh, 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 verse 6 here at a time that we need to get back to. Acts chapter 17, and look at verse 6, and we see something in here. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. That should be us today. We should be the ones that turn the world upside down. We should be the ones brought before Caesar because we're turning the world upside down. We see in the next verse, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. That's where our voice needs to be heard for the Lord today. Amen? Amen. That's how we consecrate. I'm afraid that, that when we can't sit down in front of our own families and, and pray, and thank God for what He's done for us through Jesus Christ in our salvation. And thank God for what He supplies us at that dinner table. And thank God for hearing our prayer. When we can't do that in front of our own families, then we're a bunch of wimps when you get us outside of our house. And that's truth. It's hard to digest, I understand. But it's truth. But that's a part of the doctrine of consecration. We're supposed to be living for God. Yeah. That's who we're supposed to be living for. God. Yeah. It is He that supplies all the rest. All the rest. And then what do we do with it? The time might be short, but those we need to be found faithful. We need to be found standing for the things of God when He appears in the clouds of glory. That's what we need to be found doing. Not, not cowering away somewhere. Not worried that somebody's going to sue us or somebody. Listen, there's people that are dying for the cause of Christ all over this world. Right. right here in our own nation, it's happening. Yeah. And it's not mental health and it's not guns, it's godlessness. Yeah. Chapter 15 of Romans. <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> We look at verses 1 and 2 in, in uh, chapter 15. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And what? Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to what? Okay, let me, let me try to talk a little bit about these two verses. Because in the scriptures that we've been studying in consecration in the weaker brother and the stronger brother, uh, we've been drawing a contrast between the believer that's mature in Christ and the believer who doesn't quite understand his liberty in Christ, his or her liberty in Christ, because he's not mature enough uh, to grasp the grace bestowed. You're going to hear something. i, I got to be careful because I, I, I don't want to be talking about this the whole rest of the Sunday school lesson. But... but Marion's going to be doing some, uh, she's going to be doing some songs the Lord gave her today. When you listen to the lyrics, you listen to the words of the songs. You know what? As I drive around in my car and I listen, and it's just me and the Lord, and Marion's not sitting in the passenger seat, but she's in the car. And I'm listening to this. And I'm going, oh, you know, it captures the grace. It captures every song I hear that she put together on her, I'll date myself and say album, it's a CD. Uh, every song I hear, and you'll hear it today, captures the explanation of the grace of God to, to us. We see this, and, and, and we see that so that when we are strong, we ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And, and this, 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 this mature, when we're looking at a mature brother and sister in Christ, we are to bear the infirmities of the weak. <clears throat> If you walked up to me on the street and I had a younger brother in Christ standing next to me, maybe he's just been saved and he doesn't quite understand what it means to consecrate his life to the Lord yet. He's not, you know, he has not been saved that long. 
Or maybe I had an older brother in Christ that just has never done it. <laughs> Standing next to me. If you walked up to me on the street corner and you said, Hey Bob, or hey pastor, or hey you, what do you think about this? Well, you know, the Holy Spirit of God resides in me, so I'll probably have an answer. <laughs> and I'll probably say, well, you know what? I believe, that, I, I believe that all of mankind should be maintaining God's values. That's what we should be doing. And I believe that even those people in our government, in our law enforcement, that are found in Romans chapter 13, whether they're saved or not, God said they're ministers. It's a good idea to know who you work for. And I'm, I'm going to be able to stand and, and, and speak boldly in truth so that the younger brother understands that that's what we're supposed to do. And maybe it'll give him a little bit of confidence. Amen? Amen. Just a little bit of confidence. But we're to bear. We're to bear the infirmities of the weak. That edification, when we... Well, let's talk about bear. Look at John chapter 19 with me. Chapter 19 and verse 17. I look at I look at bearing, and I look at I look at uh, the rendering that we have in the scriptures. When you look at chapter nineteen, verse seventeen, and and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. And he bearing his cross, that's none other than Jesus Christ, Amen. And he's bearing his cross. Is there anybody here? that sees that he was also bearing ours? Yeah. He, he, he was bearing my cross there too. Um, and, and I know that. And he was doing that for me in so much that he died for me. Well, we have a mamby-pamby society today that thinks that um, when this girl's getting beat up by some guy out on the street, that, the, well, i got to use the excuse of, I mean, i got to turn the other cheek. <laughs> i got to turn the other cheek. How many of you think Jesus would have walked by turning the other cheek in a situation like that? How many of you really believe that? <laughs> you see how twisted things have become? Never would that happen. Never would that happen. He, they would add a holy whooping. <laughs> just like the guys in the temple, just like the money changers, just like those folks did. Um, um, just like those folks did. Listen, you know, you got to look at the right Jesus here. Amen? Amen. And, and right. so, so we know that. We also, uh, look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6. You know, that fellow that, that, that in Oregon that rushed that shooter, he got himself shot like, what, five, six, seven times. Yeah. God bless him. Amen. Absolutely. Because he bore that for everybody there. Amen. For everybody there. He may not have been thinking about it that way, but that's certainly what he did. And there's a good, good illustration of what I'm talking about. Look at Galatians chapter 6. I didn't, I went to the wrong book. See how I am? Look at verse 2 with me. Bear ye what? One another's 
and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ. So see, grace and law do mix. Don't they? <laughs> because it says, and fulfill the law of Christ. And that's what we're to do. Now this doesn't mean uh, that, that we're to do everything that makes our neighbor happy. <laughs> that's not what it means at all. Um, this is talking about self-denial. This is talking about self-sacrifice for the things of God. For the things of God. Would it be, it would not be our will to walk past somebody. It would not be God's will for us to pass by somebody that is standing right there in our presence. In need. We remember the Samaritan, right? The good Samaritan. Um, it, would, it would not be in God's will. And, and you know what? Jesus didn't ask me. When they put him on that cross, he didn't say, Bob, is this going to hurt? He didn't say, Bob, is this going to kill me? If I do this for you? He didn't say any of that. No, that's God's grace. That's God's grace. And thank God, there was only one that had to do that. <laughs> and it's not us. Amen? But, but bearing, bearing, it requires some self-denial and some self-sacrifice on our parts and some obedience to God. That's what it requires of us. He set aside his rights to do for us what he did. Um, and he set the standard for all of us to follow as well. And when the church family, i.e. what we have here, and in a bigger picture, all the saints, all the saved people, when the church family... Uh, as a whole operates as it should, it, it, it will be, they, people will voluntarily lay aside their personal rights and they will voluntarily lay aside their personal privileges and their schedules for the sake of others in God's family. There'll be times when we'll deny ourselves so that as a church we may prosper. Does that make sense to you? And, and that's what Jesus did. He died for the church. He, he uses that in, in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives in so much that Christ loved the church in so much that he gave his life for it. He died for it. Um, yes, absolutely. We're to live a constructive life for God, for the Lord. It doesn't mean, as I said, that we're not out to try to please everyone. We're just supposed to be pleasing God. If we're pleasing God, you're going to be a good husband. If you're pleasing God, you're going to be a good wife. If you're pleasing God, you're going to be a good son. If you're pleasing God, you're going to be a good daughter. And on and on and on and on and on. Romans chapter 14 and verse 19 we see, and in, in verse 19 we see that, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherein one may, what? Edify. 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 Edification. Edify another. Um, you know, edify means for us to strengthen one another. It means to be able to impart godly instruction to one another. With that, I'll take you to Ephesians chapter 4 and, then, and read a very familiar verse to you. And then we're going to close this morning. And we're doing today what God would have us to do when we read this verse. He says in verse 11, He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And He tells us why He gave them. And He gave them for the perfecting of the who? Saints. For the saints, yeah. They're, he gave them for the saints. Um, saints are who? Us. Born again believers in Jesus Christ, yeah. And for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. The body of Christ are all the saints 
That's the body of Christ on the face of this earth. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll close out. I'm looking forward to this 11 o'clock hour. Amen? Amen? All right. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much again for your love to us. And Lord, I pray that that be a standard, it be a mirror for us, that, that, that we look to you and we see what you've done for us. And Lord, I know that there was this great movement a number of years ago. What would Jesus do? And Lord, we don't wear those things around our neck. We don't put them around our wrists. But I pray it's in our hearts. I pray it's in our hearts that when we say, what would Jesus do, that we really mean that. And Lord, that we would have the spiritual courage to stand for the things of God while standing against the things of evil. And I pray that we'll stand for one another first and foremost. Father, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.